Hey everybody, Red Mage here. Welcome back to this series where I go through different RPG products that I have and give them a quick flip through and review. In this one, I'm going to be going through three Dungeon Crawl Classics adventures. Now, I haven't done any Dungeon Crawl Classics adventures on this channel yet. I did a review of DCC um, and the like, the core book, and then two like setting books for it, Hubris and the Lengthmar set. Uh, but I haven't actually done any adventures yet, which is a shame, and that's why I'm remedying it today, <laughs> because I really, really like Dungeon Crawl Classics adventures. They're pulpy, they're over the top, they're ridiculous, like, you know, really in-your-face fantasy that it's a tone that is delightful. It's not for everybody's table, I get it. Not everyone likes DCC adventures, but they're really fun. Now, I don't really play DCC. As I said before, I play Shadow Dark primarily. I have played DCC, but mostly with funnels. I really like the DCC funnel system. One of the reasons why I like Shadow Dark is it just kind of took that idea in the gauntlet system. But I really like the DCC funnels. And this first one that I'm going to be covering, Sailors on the Starless Sea, is the funnel that I think a lot of people start with, and it's the one I started with. And so I have a really, you know, it's a close, it's close to my heart, near and dear to my heart, because when I ran it, it resulted in a 20-player character. I almost said 20-player, but 20-player 20 20 character TPK. All, there were five players, each with four characters each, and they all died over the course of the adventure. It was awesome. Everyone had a great time. Uh, people thought it was ridiculous and over the top. It was amazing. So <laughs> I really, really like this one. The second one I'm going to be covering is Doom of the Savage Kings. This one just caught my eye. I haven't run it. It seems like a really good level one adventure, but it's not completely done yet. So even though I haven't played it, it just seemed really, really cool. And there's a lot of really cool adventures here, but it seems like a great level one adventure. It's got a cool starting town. It's got a cool, like, initial hook. The dungeon seems awesome. So, again, I haven't played it, but I think it's a really cool one. And the third one that I wanted to cover was Journey to the Center of the Aerith, which I love Journey to the Center of the Earth. It's one of my favorites. And I loved, like, Night Below in 5th edition. I really, really liked uh, Out of the Abyss. The first half of it, the second half wasn't my favorite, but I love the Underdark. I love journeying through it and running into these strange places and wondrous things that the, you know, the, the hollow earth idea is such a cool one to me in, in terms of adventures. And, and this one plays into that really well. It's a journey through the Underdark, going through these weird places, ending up with this wild other world down below. Really cool idea. This is a level four adventure too, so it's a little higher for DCC. Now, one thing is, these are a little less system neutral, obviously, than a lot of the adventures that I run on this channel because DCC tends to be pretty, you know, not just mechanically specific with a lot of its features, but tonally specific. It goes for a very particular kind of game. But I do think it's fairly, I won't say easy, it's not impossible. And it's <laughs> maybe relatively hard, but objectively fairly simple to transfer DCC adventures over to other adventures, other over to other systems, I should say. You know, you have to change some stat blocks, you have to modify some things, but it's not that bad. It's really not that bad. The stuff that really would be different would be like spellcaster's magic and the way that spells interact with things, because that's a really complex system in DCC, at least it seems so to me, having not played it a ton. Played around with it, but never really done a really long campaign with DCC past level one or two. I mean, really, we haven't played anything past that. Level zero funnels is kind of what I go through. So just, you know, this is going to be a little less system neutral than I often cover on my channel, or generally system neutral, close to system neutral, system neutral adjacent. But still, I think these are all great adventures, especially if you want to run DCC. At least it seems to me. The first one, absolutely, the other two seem really cool. And the ideas you can take from them, obviously, are applicable anywhere. So DCC, Sailors of the Starless Sea, the art in all Dungeon Crawl Classics modules is just top notch. It's incredible. I love it, love it, love it. So good. Sailors on the Starless Sea, a level zero adventure. Tons of play testers, great art even on the like acknowledgements page, title page. There's just art all throughout these books, draws you right in. This is super good. Now, it says that it's designed for 10 to 15 level zero characters. Each player should have three characters and in play test groups of 15 PCs, seven or eight typically survive. Now that seems to be true and I think, well, I'll get to it when I get to it, but the scene that's depicted here with the boat and the tentacles, I was brutal running this section, and I, I wanted the players to find a creative solution, which they had plenty of options to do, and they never found one. They just they just tried to brute force it, and they died. So that's kind of, like, it doesn't have to be a TPK if you let them, yeah, if you do some things. But anyway, I'll talk about them when we get into it. Um, this is the background of the adventure. There's a, a, a castle up on the hill, Chaos Castle, and there's a, you know, a 
keep, uh, ruin keep now, of course, but there is a cavern below, and there's a chaos god, and there are crypts and things, and the place has, uh, has a bad reputation. And you're the villagers of the town nearby, and people have been taken, and you're done with it. You're going to go there, and you're going to, you know, put an end to it, or maybe loot it, or whatever, <laughs> right? The time for retribution has come, you and your peasant companions. Which is why it's a great level zero adventure, because it has a good reason for peasants to be trying to do something really dangerous, right? They're, they're, they're sick of it. They're going to put an end to this. D10 rumors table, and I think these are good because they are gameable. Not all of them, but but they're they're good. They, they tell you either what you're going to be dealing with, sometimes not truly, <laughs> which I, 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 have a, I have mixed feelings about false rumors, things that are completely untrue. I like rumors that are understandably untrue, right? Like, there's a, a rumor about something that's a misunderstanding of what it really is, but it's close to what it actually is, or it gives you the players a clue. Uh, I don't like things that are just completely false. That doesn't bother, that kind of bothers me. Some of these are just completely false, like the one about the dragon. There is no dragon here. No, that's not to say there's a, there's a dangerous thing here, but there's no wishing dragons in this adventure, <laughs> at least as far as I know. You have an encounter table where things are in the adventure with combat, trap, and... Um, the P, I forget what the P stands for. Um, I'm not sure. But combat and trap encounters, which is really cool that it has a breakdown of where you're going to run into encounters as you go through. Great map of the upper level. And that's one thing is the maps, DCC maps can be a little busy sometimes with just the sheer amount of stuff on them, but they are visually appealing, visually enthralling in, in some ways. And I love how this one looks. It's really cool looking with the, the thorns at the bottom edges, or the, all the corners, really. Signs of chaos. That, yeah, I love this one. This also shows you a really a really clear view of what's going on here. Uh, you have visually drawn on the map where everything is, not just numbers, not just indeed, but like right there. Okay, here's the, uh, you know, the, the ruined chapel, here's the big sinkhole, here's the well, here's the hidden ruin, or the hidden rune, I should say, below the earth. Here's the gatehouse with the thing bridge across it. There's the tree with the creatures you're going to fight right away. There's the tower. And it's all there on the map. Description of the Ruin Keep. Now, it does tend towards more old school. And I've talked about this recently. But more old school paragraph text rather than bullet pointing and bolding and italicizing. Now, it does italicize kind of description text. You should read aloud text if you want to read that to your players. And it is, it is read aloud text, right? To your horror, you realize the bodies are still moving. So you're supposed to read that to your players. It's not directed at the, at the DM or the GM. Then you get a description of what's actually going on and the creatures. Now the creatures are bolded, which is nice, but there's not a lot beyond that in terms of helping you parse the paragraph quickly. But it's good writing, and the DCC books are almost always good writing, so it's not bad. It doesn't, again, it's a design choice. It's not a failing, exactly. Some people are going to prefer it, some people aren't. You get the Tomb of the Fallen, which is a separate, I mean, almost like a side quest here. You don't have to go through it if your goal is to get down into the, t the, the, the level below. The Tomb of the Fallen is basically secondary. Puzzles there, and kind of have to figure out how to get through it, but there is a very powerful axe here. Great items there as well. And it's another kind of way, well, not really a way in, but it's just something the players could do. Maybe it's, you know, one of the things they could be here to, to, to do, is to try to find that, that crypt. There's the courtyard, gatehouse, beastmen here with random mutations for the beastmen. I like that a lot. Going to have different beastmen each time makes them really chaotic, right? Chaos in this book is not just like, uh, freedom. <laughs> no, chaos is chaos in the DCC books. And I like that. The Charnel Ruins and the the, uh, the Tar Ooze. That's such a cool creature. That caused a couple deaths in my game. Players got really unlucky. Um, the characters got really unlucky and they couldn't kill it for a few rounds. And it just melted them. Melted a few PCs. Because it's a D4 plus Ignite, but level zero characters, that's just killing a character basically every hit. It only gets one hit around, but still. I think it got like three rounds of attacks off or something like that. So, really good. The Well of Souls. Uh, gotta be careful down here. <laughs> the, the victim never strikes the bottom if you are thrown into the well. That's one of the rumors is don't go into the well, right? And so if you go, that's a good one. There's a trap here you could choose to ignore it, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna end well if you go down the well. And then you get the uh, classic characters uh, from the uh, from the back of the DCC book, the ones with the, the hero with the striped pants and the lady with no pants. That's oh, so good. Very, very flavorful. 
the death of rat face slipshot. Now this is intended for level zero characters, but you could also run this for level one characters, and I think there are rules for how to do that. Um, it says, you know, here's here's how many you would want, uh, here's you know, might, what you might want to change, things like that. There's also a place to get replacement PCs, which is good for a level zero adventure. If you, um, I think one of the players, when I played this, had run out of characters by this point, um, and so we gave him a character. He got another guy back. Of course, he died very quickly thereafter, <laughs> but he got, you know, he got a character back and could play a little longer. Here is the second level, the actual, like, you know, under, uh, under the keep, and then the, the the starless sea that you're supposed to be sailing across. Now, one of the things that's funny is that the the name of the starless sea implies this much bigger thing than what you, what seems to me you kind of run into. It's not a problem exactly. But it is, it, it, it might be, if you told the players we're going to play Sailors on the Starless Sea, they might have a different idea than kind of sailing across a lake to a ziggurat, which is really cool, don't get me wrong. But maybe just a slight mislabeling or something like that. Or maybe you could just imply that the, the sea is much bigger. Or, as someone in my other channel recommended, not my other channel, my other video, excuse me, on this channel, recommended you could use this to go right into the Shadow Veins tr uh, trilogy, or at least the Shadow Veins set from Advanced Adventures. Uh, because you, one of the ways you end this adventure is by going down the river into the darkness. So that'd be really cool. You just go right into that. That's a great idea. Starless Sea, Trail of Gold, Empty Vault, Dread Hall. There's some good puzzles in here, figuring out what the place was like. It's not necessarily, it doesn't seem to me to be super necessary, but there's a really, really uh, valuable band of fire in here, which is very powerful um, when worn by low-level characters. And when you're worn by a wizard, you get an additional bonus. Um, but when you're when you're just doing low-level characters, you get Scorching Ray, you get Fire Resist, and you get Magic Missile thrice per day, or thrice per day, twice per day, once per day, <laughs> in the other in reverse order. Very good, and it can grant additional powers to powerful wizards. So that's a really cool item to get at the end of this or throughout this adventure. Then you get the Starless Sea itself, the Dragon Ship. Maybe that's what the the rumor is about the Dragon Ship. Maybe. I guess I could see that. And then there's the Leviathan. How to deal with the Leviathan. Now, one of the things it says is that, uh, I think it says somewhere in here that if once it takes like one each or something like that, or once it takes a few, it'll stop. I didn't have it do that. It says that uh, the judge is encouraged to entertain clever solutions and punish foolish ones. And they didn't try anything. They just tried to slice it. They just tried to slice at the... Leviathan as it came out, and I was like, man, it, it's just going to keep taking. I don't know why it wouldn't stop. Um, yeah, so that was it. They just tried to slice those, and I let them, the, the remaining characters die. So we never actually got to the end, the Temple of Chaos itself. They died against the Leviathan, the last players. But still, it was really fun, and they were all laughing, and we all had a good time. Um, when you get the Ziggurat itself, this seems like a really hard final 22 Beastmen. <laughs> I mean, granted. I, I didn't end up doing this. We never got here, so I can't say how hard it is, but it seems really dang hard to me. 22 Beastmen and the uh, the cultist himself, with the flail. The shaman, the chaos lord, animated effigy, and the Beastmen acolytes all at the top. The spiked flail, all that. And then if you survive, you, the Zurat crashes and you sail across the cavern into the darkness below. Um, there is a area H added into this, which is new. This wasn't in the version I had, which was a print version. Um, so I don't know how this particular adventure plays. But it seems pretty cool. It seems metal. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the line of this adventure, certainly. Um, pretty dang cool here. There are some handouts, which I think is really great. Handouts in any sort of adventure are fun. I had these printed out and I gave them to my players so they could see the murals that were in the in the uh, adventure. We're with the band. Classic. Great piece of art there of a minotaur. Standees or maybe just monster portraits if you want to show the players what they look like. And then the peasants storming the front. It's a great three-page spread there. Really good. Really good. Sailors on the Starless Sea, number 67. I highly recommend it. Okay, the next one is Doom of the Savage Kings. As I said, 66.5. I don't actually know why it does that, 66.5. But it's a level one adventure for DCC, obviously, as well. And the art is great. It's a little shorter. It's only 20 pages instead of 30. Um, once again, you get amazing art. Just so good. 
<laughs> uh, and of course, the interior artists are Doug Kovacs and Stefan Poag, which, you know, you know I like his style. Just slicing through the thing, and then there's that snake coming out. Gruesome. I love it. Now, the adventure here is that there is this village in the wilderness that is under siege. There's a devil hound who stalks the village, and you have to try to deal with it somehow. You, you're free to explore, as this adventure points out. You can revisit old locales in search of new clues. You can question NPCs and track down rumors. But there really are three locations. There's the village, there's the tomb, and then there's the sunken fens, uh, where the, the hound is, is born. The Hound of Herat, it's a pretty strong creature. Um, it's got 4d12 hit dice, uh, 20 hit points. It can fly, has gaseous form, it's immune to charm effects. It's immortal, <laughs> unless you kill it a very certain way. Um, judges are free to adjudicate proposed solutions as they see fit, erring on the side of dramatic heroics. Love that. Great advice. Just, you know, it's gotta be, it's gotta be cool. That's the answer. It's not, it can't be stupid, it can't be something dumb. It's gotta be heroic, dramatic and heroic in order to bind the hound. There are some suggestions. Mortal strength in the uh, tradition of Beowulf rites, you have to wrestle it. You must physically restrain it. You can shackle it with uh, shackles made from the hair of corpses. It's really creepy. I would, so it's called Shackles of the Mad Widow. Woven from the hair of seven corpses can bind any supernatural beast. I was thinking, what if it's made from the hair of like the, the, the kin of those killed by the beast? That'd be kind of cool. You could do it that way too if you didn't want to be as, as grim as going through getting corpses and taking their hair. It's kind of, you know, if you wanted to modulate that darkness a little bit. And then there's the wolf spear. You can pin it to the hound, to the ground. Pin the hound before delivering the death blow. So it's kind of the, you know, in the vein of, again, Beowulf, which I love. Herat, which is like Heorot from Beowulf itself. Herat. Rumors, legends, and superstitions. A D24 table. That's one thing, right, is that DCC has funky dice, so you kind of have to get used to that. And again, there is uh, there are false rumors here. Um, just straight up false rumors. The Hound will not attack a person of true faith. Um, well, silver weapons sear the Hound like flaming brands. If someone hears that rumor and they go and grab it, unless they have another reason to doubt that, right? Like they ever hear a rumor and then an NPC says, no, 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 I saw someone take a silver weapon to it. And then they can go like, well, is it, should we try it or not? If it's just they hear this rumor, hey, yeah, silver weapons work against this hound. They go, okay, cool. Well, then we'll all get silver weapons. I mean, they go to fight it. Uh-oh. We're, we're doomed. I don't like rumors like that that can really result in the players getting screwed over. Uh, you know, I don't like that. So I like rumors to be gameable. And if they're false, at least they're reasonably false or they're false in like a certain way or they're misunderstandings of the truth or something like that. Or the players have an opportunity before they fight, and you're very clear about this, to give them alternate, the alternate view. And that, that way, and, and depending on the reliability of that source, you can then maybe help them out, right? Maybe if they're just in the tavern and the local town drunk says this, maybe they're not going to take it as seriously. But if it's just a rumor that they start with, that's a problem, I would say. But it says when the need arises, so roll or choose. And I would... You know, maybe have the, 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 the dumb NPC that no one trusts be the one that tells them that silver weapons work. That way, if the players believe them, it's more like, okay, in-world and in-character. In Role-playing the non-player characters with a breakdown of what they're like. That's cool. Players start by, or the adventure starts with this woman being sacrificed, and you can choose to intervene or not. And if you do, then you might have some trouble with the village. Right? If you fight them, or kill the, kill the peasants, or try to fight the Jarl then you might, you might get into some trouble. The, the village will be a bit more harder for you to interact with, unless you're kind of murder hobos, in which case you just you know, kill everybody and then go to the village and kill everybody and take everything. You very much easily could. Uh, but if you help them, or if you negotiate with them, or if, as the game suggests, perhaps the players let them chain the girl to the altar, then all the peasants leave in terror, and then the heroes free her before the hound shows up to eat her, devour her then that would, be, um, that would be great. If that happens, though, then they're going to have to fight the Hound right then and there. Right, probably. But you get a description of the town. You get a description of what uh, is going on. There's a, it seems to me that there's a reference here to Dragon Slayer. This idea of you reach into the box and you take the name of the person who's to be sacrificed. Um, yeah. That's interesting, right? It's interesting. The lottery there. Uh, 
otherwise, the town is pretty good, pretty straightforward. There are cool NPCs here. Uh, there's the crone who <laughs> lend her aid to the PCs on the condition that one PC marries her once the hound is slain. And she can weave the shackles capable of binding the hound. Uh, if you don't, if you make the, if you make the deal, it um, doesn't work out. But it turns out uh, that the widow is not as young, lovely, and bedecked with flowers. Um, and she actually isn't going to actually marry them. It gives them a bunch of blessings and then leaves. So you actually get a whole bunch of uh, stuff if you agree to it and come back and promise to marry this, marry this, this crone. That's kind of cool. I like that. If you, if you renege on your promise, you're going to get messed up. But if you promise and, and follow through, you might not be. Uh, cool creature there. And then you get the altar and then the tomb uh, beneath the uh, beneath the earth. With a good description of it, again, it, it tends to be on that paragraphy side of things, but it's not bad. And you get the wolf spear if that's the path forward that you want to take. There's also the horn of kings, which is really cool. Then you get the lair of the hound, which is where you fight the thing. And there's some stuff down there. There's a shield, a plus one shield. There's a great helm. Um, and there is a torque decorated with gold wire. And there's the black pool. And the orb which you can take from the pool, can be used by spellcasters. So there's a lot of magic items in here for level 1 characters. They're going to get a lot out of this. Um, that's pretty cool. Here's a map of the village with the breakdown of the locations. It's a nice little, you know, Viking-esque built village. <laughs> I like it. It's pretty cool. Reminiscent of Heorot, right? The idea. And you get the wilderness map. I like this too. It gives you a good relation of where things are to each other with, I guess, you know, absolute distances in yards. It's not all that far to the sunken fens, um, but it's just, it's very flavorful, flavorful. And I love the, the art, the incidental art on the top and bottom of the page. Really cool. I mean, that's one thing, again, I'll say about DCC is every book is just jam-packed, you know, dripping with flavor. Here is the tomb that you can find the wolf spear in the hands of the dead Viking king. Cool adventure. Really cool. I love how it looks. And I like how there's a little image on the crawl space entry there. Just a little bit more. And then there's the side view of the tomb as well. Busy, like all of the DCC maps tend to be. But I like it. Nonetheless, I, th I think it's really, really good. And then yeah, we're with the band at the end. Doom of the Savage Kings. So I really like this one. I, I highly recommend it just from view. Again, I haven't played this one, so I can't say that it's awesome to play. But from what I read, if I was going to run a level 1 DCC adventure, I think I would start with this. The tone is much more, I would say, serious, less like Wild and Gonzo than a lot of DCC adventures tend to be. Certainly less than, I'd say, Sailors on the Starless Sea, certainly less than Journey to the Center of the Aerith, which we're going to read here. Aerith? 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 <laughs> Aerith. Which is the next one here, number 91. Um, this one is, again, just so engaging to me because of this whole concept of going down beneath the Earth. And you get a really cool overview of the place that you're going to end up, which is Lost Agartha, the Blood Heaths, where players start. Uh, Barakol, the Bleak Shores, um, Gartukula. It's like something from, I don't know, H.P. Lovecraft. There's the Inner Sea. There's a sunken city on the far side, Ishna. Journey to the center of the Aerith. So you essentially just decide you're going to go down. You begin outside a ruined temple city set in the distant north and awash in the crush of glacial ice. However, the city is not wholly abandoned. Degenerate descendants of the former slaves still haunt the outskirts of the city. Savages bent on ensuring that the ancient ruins are left undisturbed, lest they call back their ancient masters. So you go up to the frozen north, you find the ruins of this ancient city, and you go down into the earth. And then you go tr through the earth, and you find the, uh, the world mirroring our own, lit by a smoky sun. Such a cool idea. And then there's the Agartans, who are ancient elephantine creatures. That's something like out of, uh, reminds me of, yeah, Robert E. Howard's Tower of the Elephant. And that's what's referenced here in the introduction. But you also get Beyond the Mountains of Madness by H.P. Lovecraft, totally. Uh, and Pellucidar by Edgar Rice Burroughs. So there's a lot of influence here that I really, really like. Lots of good adventure hooks with encounter tables. Now, the encounter tables aren't really necessarily one dungeon because you're going through the entire place. So this one's 56 pages. It's a bit longer than the other adventures. The City Beyond the North Winds, so you have a lot of different locations that you have to go through in order to get finally to the end. Because it's, it, this is more like, it feels like more of a campaign than it does one adventure. Because again, you're going through lots of different locations and you're traveling a very long distance through the ruined city. And then even though there aren't that like a million locations to find in all those places. 
Hyperborean Lotus. That's awesome. Be going to the Great Gate, beyond the Great Gate, and go down through the city, and then you get to the Journey section. And there are rules for how to do this travel. The Underworld map is broken into 50-mile hexes, so you're, you're really going, right, 100 miles a week. You're going quite far over the course of this adventure. It really is a, a journey. And that's really cool that you get all that in one book. Uh, character strength within the world's core, which is really cool, right? So as you go down, uh, the effective mass beneath them dwindles while that above them increases, resulting in lower gravity environment where objects are effectively lighter. The journey takes place in three relative depths throughout the on, on levels. So your strength goes up, your speed goes up, and your jump distance goes up as you go down through the earth. It becomes almost like another world. Strength score gets plus five when you're in level C. You get speed of plus 15 feet. Your jump, jump distance is plus 15 feet. You're really in like a different world. That's cool. It reminds me of something like, you know, John Carter of Mars. Suddenly you can like leap and do all these things. The way gates beneath the earth, 10,000 tongues, the river crossing, troll nests. As you cross through, there's a good Peter Mullen piece. I like that one. The crystal caves, these horrible locust, you know, um, Mantis men, that's what I'm looking for, Mantis men. 3D4, pl 3D4 per band of all of them, then just tons of them. They're not terribly too hard. Well, they've got 11 hit points each, but this is a level four adventure, so by this point, you've you got some power as PCs. That's a great piece. I love that one. It's something, you know, Journey to the Center of the Earth, um, plus Conan the Barbarian added together. I love it. Absolutely love it. Cool dinosaurs you're going to be <laughs> riding on underneath the earth. Another great Peter Mullen piece. you got to try to catch them and then use them to ride them. That's so cool. Cliff Dwellings of the Sky Riders. The, the ideas in this book are just, it's just punch, I don't know, punch after punch uh, of great ideas, flavorful ideas, sword and sorcery, uh, pulp adventure ideas. Totally great. The Twilight Shores of the Giants down here. Another great Peter Mullen piece. And I love... You can see the giants, you can see the guys hiding in the rocks, and you can see the cities in the distance. So cool. So dang cool. The bleak shores, the blood heaths, the inner sea, the little slave cities of Las Agartha. The band resists the psionic assault of the Agartan masters below. Lots of sacrifices there. Horrible spiders. I'm horribly arachnophobic, so... Spiders are great to use in games because I feel horrified whenever I use them. <laughs> um, the Sky Dock. There's a Sky Dock down here, a floating vessel. Ethonian, Ethothian longship. Capable of traveling across dimensions and sailing the high astral. Well, maybe you take that, and that's a way out of this place. And then there's an Appendix A, Random Encounter and Events Tables. Which you're going to need a Random Encounter as you're traveling through the, through the Earth. Bleak Shores encounter tables, Blood Heaths encounter tables, Spine Ridges encounter tables, Inner Sea encounter tables. Uh, and then if you're, you know, on the Heaths, Fire at Night, in the Spine Ridges, Caves, Encampment modifiers, and things like that. There's an encounter list down here, and a description of each of them. Lots of them. Flotsam you might run into. Horrible, gross glowworms that burrow into you. More art. More great tables, weakness tables, sample cave maps. Which, you're gonna run into caves. Here's the Spine Ridge Cave Complexes. Scale can vary. It's up to you what the scale you want the scale to be. Underwater at night. It's kind of up and down. A Garden Treasure Tables. And the effects of different spices you can run into. The distilled mucus things that you can find. Gross. And an epilogue, how to keep running if you want to go past this adventure. And here's the map of the glacier uh, and the city there. Um, the city, the living pit that you can go into. The Agartan Underworld. It's really big. You're traveling for 50 miles per hex, so it's old ways, natural caves, river rifts, and there's different ways of going if you at times need to take different paths to get to the shore. Really cool. Really dang cool. You get the Court of the Slave Lords. Something to run into there. That's straight up out of Conan. The top one there, the player handout A, show them the elephant, the Tower of the Elephant, right? Player handout B, C, D, you get plenty of player handouts. And we're with the band and a great cutback cover. So I highly recommend this one in terms of ideas. This is one that I want to run even if I don't play it in DCC. I'd, I'd convert it. Play a, a long, a long, you can play in a few sessions, I suppose, but you can play a campaign going under the world, going into this place, and having a really cool, pulpy, sword and sorcery, Conan the Barbarian, Edgar Rice Burroughs adventure. That's great. Super cool. So, Journey to the Center of the Aerith. 
Doom of the Savage Kings, and Sailors on the Starless Sea. Highly recommend them all. I'll put links below to where you can get them. All right, guys. I hope this has been interesting, and I'll see you in another video.